Jane from Vertical Measures, and I'm here hosting VM's monthly webinar series. Today's webinar is titled, Can Small Business SEO Compete with Big Brands? And will be presented by our very own SEO specialist, Brenna Baldock, and SEO strategist, Christina Heck. As an SEO specialist, Brenna works in developing the rank and reach of client websites by optimizing the on and off page aspects, and also helps each client to balance the content and necessary snippets of code to create a well-ranking and converting website. Christina has spent her career cross-training in several areas of digital marketing and is passionate about educating clients on the technical workings and gratifying results of organic SEO. Before we get started and I hand over the presentation, I just have a few housekeeping items to note. Today's webinar will be available for viewing by tomorrow, and we'll go ahead and send out an email with the link to both the slides and the video. We'll also be happy to answer any of your questions. So if you take a peek at your webinar interface, there is a little question applet where you can send anything you'd like me to ask Brenna and Christina at the end of their presentation. Alternatively, you can also tweet us with the hashtag VMWebinar and we'll get them that way as well. I think that's all the notes I have, other than if you have any technical problems, the best way I find to fix that is just to disconnect and then try reconnecting, and usually that solves the issue. So before we get started, we're gonna just ask one little poll question. So I'm gonna launch this, and if you guys could answer what size organization do you work in? So I see we're getting some answers. It looks like a lot are 0 to 20 employees, but then we also have a nice amount of percentage of 100 and more employees. Or there's just a few of us solopreneurs, entrepreneurs. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you for that information. And I will go ahead and hand this off to Christina and Brenna. Oh, we'll go to the next slide. There we go. We so, have... I'm Christina Heck. Thanks for coming, everybody, today. Um, recently, I read a book by uh, Malcolm Gladwell, David, and Goliath. And the story is one that we've all heard. David the shepherd was sent to fight Goliath the giant. And Goliath was prepared for hand-to-hand -hand combat um, with his size and swords and a shield. And small little David bested the giant by staying far away, and he slung a rock right into his eye. And so Malcolm Gladwell says there's a powerful lesson in that for battles with all kinds of giants. The powerful and strong are not always what they seem. And that got us thinking about small businesses against brands and SEO. And some of the tenets that we believe is that everybody thinks um, that brands have advantages. But sometimes advantages are disadvantages, and vice versa. So small brands can really swoop in and surprise big brands with their audience um, and their audience with their agility and their accuracy and preparation, just like David. Brenna? So a little bit about vertical measures and why we wanted to do this. Christina and I both love helping people. It's one of the main reasons we got into SEO because everyone has a website. You can help. Your mom, she's probably got a website. You can help a huge company with a website. Everyone's got it. It's an opportunity to help everyone. And that's something that Christina and I are both passionate about and something that really keeps us satisfied in our job. So we get that great opportunity at Vertical Measures all the time. We work with small businesses from little guys who are just themselves and maybe are just starting out. We also work with huge companies. Well, we love the huge companies. We love the small businesses a little bit more because we get to know a little bit about who they are and we get to talk to someone who has their hands in everything and knows the business so incredibly well. It's an honor to be able to talk to people who are just owning their space. So let's talk a little bit about the myth itself. We, we seem to all believe there's this pervasive myth that big brands get a pass from Google um, even when they're engaging in spammy practices. Sometimes we know that they're engaging in spammy practices, and sometimes we just think, gosh, brands are showing up in the search engine results pages all the time, and I can't seem to break through um, to page one. They must be doing something spammy. So the truth is that um, 
big brands get penalized too, but it's their overall strength that allows them to sustain and recover even during a penalty or um, right after a penalty. So, but we're all the same. All small businesses complain that they're not shown enough in search and brands complain because they think they're not shown enough in search. So eventually what happens is if there's a penalty, penalties can happen to anyone when you're scheming or gaming the system or buying links or you have thin or over-optimized content. So the reality is everybody's in the same big pot of soup. And what brands do have going for them is that they have the age and the affinity, like brand recognition, um, to kind of sustain. And then they also tend to hit a lot of algorithmic points. They are you know, doing all, a lot of things right. Um, they also have money to, to spend on other channels and content promotion. They don't have to wait for things to organically happen sometimes. And they have tons of people to create content. So as small business owners, we think, what do we need to do? What can we do? Well, the first thing we need to do is get over that myth. Just get over it. You need to figure out why brands are succeeding in your particular space. And then you need to make a plan and you need to start content marketing. And we're going to work on um, kind of creating that plan and how to start content marketing today. So, but first, let's look at some of those things that we talked about with Malcolm Gladwell's point that advantages are sometimes disadvantages. For big brands, the advantages that they have going for them, oftentimes, it's money, right? We always think money talks. They have tons of money sometimes to push toward um, promotion or advertising, um, public relations, things like that. Um, they have money to invest in people. They have human resources to create content. They can go out and hire a corporate journalist or a brand editor and just PR people, marketing people, and visual artists to create interesting visual content. They ha usually have a good lock on their audience. They can um, tap into the brand recognition and loyalty, and they have a wide reach, uh, again, coming back to their, their spend. Um, and we talked a little bit about that they can hit those algorithmic points. And they do that by having a professional SEO department in-house or working with an agency. They might have access to big, expensive data reports and the intellect to dive through those reports and slice and dice the data. Um, they can obviously create content. They can build links to those content, to that content, naturally and both and unnaturally. Um, and they can really engage with their customers that they've had for a long time. The last thing that they have going for them is that they can—they have potential to get into the knowledge graph, which is the box on the right-hand side of Google that you see when you search questions like, if I type in, how old is Betty White, I might get a knowledge box or a knowledge graph that says um, her age, and it might have excerpts and links from Twitter or IMDb or Wikipedia. On the disadvantage side, Money can get in the way. Sometimes it can stifle your agility. We all know that brands sometimes have a hard time spinning on a dime and um, competing with um, other people or moving with the flow of how fast SEO is going and how fast things change. Um, they need to convince a lot of people in order to uh, get buy-in from disparate departments like legal or sometimes accounting or procurement will get in there. And this is just a shameless plug, but sometimes you have to convince your boss to engage in content marketing and invest in it. So you might want to go to convinceyourboss.com, uh, which is a vertical measures uh, project that we're working on. Um, for their audience, sometimes they've set their audience way too wide, and they can't get micro-local. They just don't have access to that man on the street, um, street level view that small businesses can get. And with the algorithm, a lot of the time, they make a lot of mistakes. They move too fast. They buy links. They can. They've done things in the past that we've had to actually undo here at Vertical Measures. They can cannibalize their own content by making so much so fast that they don't optimize one page for one particular keyword because um, they've lost track of their overall content inventory. And the last thing that they don't have going for them is they have a blind spot. They are not expecting you, just like Goliath was not expecting David. So you guys are probably pretty familiar with the advantages and disadvantages of having and working in a small business. Um, we're just going to go through a few things fairly quickly just so we can better uh, communicate about what we want to talk about. So you're more wary of making decisions. You have better understanding of your choices. You are the sole person 
making the decision, you understand X, Y, Z points. You don't have to go and say, oh, legal, how do I do this? Is this proper? You've got that information already. At the same time, you've got fewer people to coordinate, so you've got a better chance at a single voice. When you're doing communications, whether it be in a video or in social media or you're writing a blog post, you're able to drive the same message home in the same way. You don't have to worry about, oh, the content writer used the wrong verbiage or they didn't include the correct slogan because you are the person or the few people doing it. You're totally bought into the company. You understand what you want the message to be. You've also got a better opportunity for genuine audience interaction because people don't want to listen to big brands. They want to listen to people. They don't want to go on Twitter and say, hey, so-and-so, can you help me with this? They don't want to talk to a brand. They want to be able to have that interaction and get someone on the phone and not have to go through a thousand different hoops, et cetera, just to talk to someone. Also, playing by the algorithmic rules in the end is a much better strategy. Because you don't have $500,000 to throw at one single part, you can proceed with caution. You can go more slowly. You can make sure that you understand what you're investing in before just throwing money at the problem and trying to solve it that way. These also kind of come as disadvantages. I'm sure you guys know this. You don't have as much money to put toward wide-scale promotions and big data tools. Most of the time, you don't need big data tools. You just don't have the traffic or the means to just need that. So that's OK, actually. You also have fewer people to do the work. Unfortunately, you have to work a few more hours. But at the same time, like I said before, you've got a better chance at making a single voice and making sure that you are actually interacting with your audience and not just some intern out there in a computer somewhere. They know it's actually going to be you. But your audience may be harder to understand and develop uh, those personas and reach because you've got less data on them. So you don't have those big data tools to go out and grab that. But chances are you know the people in your community anyway, the people who you're trying to reach. If you're a small little guy, you understand what your market is probably better than someone who's been doing it for a long time. You're quicker, you've got your finger on the trigger, you're in that community every day. However, you're also slower to see the improvements when you have to play by the rules. Unfortunately, and this is true in most of life, right? When you play by the rules, you don't always win as quickly, but in the long run, play for the long game. Be the hare and <laughs> just try to get through what you can. So how to compete with big brands. So we're going to walk you through these steps, and we're going to break them down really well for you. This is just a little slide to let you know what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about competitive keyword research, basic on-site optimization, how to do content ideation, content creation, and how to kind of be where the big brands are not expecting you so you can get them with that one-two punch. So competitive research. There are so many wonderful free tools out there that we wanted to let you guys know about. Google AdWords Keyword Planner. This is the foremost tool that most people use. Yes, even large big brands still use it. It's free, 100%. All you have to do is sign up for an AdWords account, which you can also do um, if you've got any Google account already. A Gmail address, perfect. KeywordTool.io um, and ubersuggest.org are wonderful. They take those Google Suggest boxes and they just compile them into uh, an easy to use platform. So the method I'm going to walk you through actually on the next slide. So this is your first thing you're going to do. You're going to take your competitor and you're going to enter them into the AdWords keyword tool. You can actually put in any URL. And this is awesome because it shows you exactly what keywords on the page Google thinks are relevant. Usually those are the keywords that they're going to be ranking for already. So luckily for you, you can use any URL. When you enter your competitor's URL, you'll see all the keywords they're ranking for. You can cross compare, OK, are these the keywords I'm trying to target? Are they not? the same keywords, are there long tail keywords here that I could try to move into that space. Um, you can do some analysis into how well they're actually optimized for those keywords, and maybe you can do it a little better. The next thing you want to do is enter your landing page in here. So do the same set of keywords come up? If you've got a little bit of a smaller overlap, I would say maybe find a different competitor who fits into your field a little bit better. So they might be a slightly smaller brand, um, than what you originally had in mind. We all think we're competing with the Googles of the world, right? Well, sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're competing with the little local guys. So identifying who your actual competition is through looking at overlapping keywords is a great way to do that. So after you've got your keyword set, 
you can uh, put that into, up at the top right, keywordtool.io. And this is awesome because it will show you what people are searching for around that specific keyword. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the phrase uh, long tail keyword, but it just means instead of looking for something like office chairs, you're looking for affordable leather office chairs. Just a few more keywords around that main keyword to help clarify what the user is searching for. And maybe you're a little bit um, farther down in the sales funnel, you actually know what you want from an office chair. So keyword tool to IO is awesome because it helps you identify those long tail keywords and you can use those in your content marketing instead of just the main keyword. It also shows you some of the more semantic keywords that go around that. So you can make your language a little bit more natural when you are writing about your main keywords in your content. So after you've found your keyword, you're going to want to do some basic on-site optimization. <clears throat> this is a little snapshot of verticalmeasures.com, and it's just to show you the kinds of things that you want to optimize on your own website. So very first at the top in the left-hand corner is your title tag. This is just telling everyone what you're about. What's the title of this page? You want to include your keyword in there, but only one time. Don't try to stuff a whole bunch of keyword's in there. It's just not going to work out well for you. So we will penalize you if you do that. Um, but there are lots of good resources out there about how to properly craft a title tag and how many characters it needs to be. And we have included all of those resources. Um, at the very end of this presentation, there's a resources page. And you can go ahead and click on that. It's got tons of in-depth information. The next thing you want to optimize is your image. So there are three main ways that you can optimize an image. And it can be any kind of image. It can be an infographic. It can be a little bio, like headshot. It can be the main picture on a page. It doesn't matter what it is. You can optimize it. You want to make sure it's small enough to load quickly, but that it's also good quality and is still helpful to people on the page. A lot of people just make their images super huge, and then they take forever to download. You also want to make sure that your file name has the keyword in there. So again, if you're selling office chairs and you've got a picture of an office chair, when you create the uh, little image to put up on your website, you want to name it officechair.jpg or leather office chair or be descriptive about what you're actually selling and what the image is actually up. It's the same thing with the alt tag. Since Google can't actually see the image, your alt tag tells Google what the image is. So your alt tag should be nice leather office chair or something similar. You want to use whatever keywords it is. If it's the top keywords that are office chair, if it's the long tail keywords that are red leather affordable office chair, you want to be sure to include those in every aspect of your optimization. The next thing is actually the H1 tag. So this might be new to a few of you. It is the title of the page. That's all it is. It should contain your keyword or a keyword variation, and it just tells people what they should expect when they read further content which leads us to the content, the meat and potatoes of the page. It should obviously include your keywords, um, maybe variations of your keywords, and it should be readable for humans. This is something I cannot stress enough. Do not write it where you've got a keyword every two to three words. It's just not going to be helpful to anyone who comes to the page. They're just going to leave and say, well, this isn't written for me to actually read. This is written for search engines. You don't want to do that. You want to make sure it's readable text that humans can read on a good contrasting background that's able to be understood easily. You also want to make sure that you're including words that are related uh, to what your content is about. So if you're writing about office chairs, you want to make sure that you're talking about maybe the fabric or the casters. Does it roll? Is it plush? Is it affordable? Does it have arms? These are all just kind of semantic keywords you'd want to include if you're writing about this specific product. For every industry, it's going to be different but it's the little things that people search that helps Google associate those kind of semantic keywords with what your um, head terms are. One thing that actually isn't shown on the page, <coughs> excuse me, and only exists um, in the back end of your website is called your meta description. So this is something that's shown in the search engine results when you actually get through to Google, and it's used as a call to action. So you would want to say, looking for an office chair, we've got the best selection, or whatever includes your keywords, maybe a long tail phrase, whatever you're targeting for that specific page, and include a call to action. Make it clear and concise. And then the very last thing, which again, you cannot see in this page, is Google Analytics. Make sure you've got it installed. 
it is the number one 100% free software that will change the way your business works. Google Analytics is a free program that you can implement a small tracking code onto your site. Very easy. You don't need a developer to do it, I promise you. And it will show you the little things like how much traffic is coming to your website, where is it coming from, are you um, being effective on your social media, uh, what's the bounce rate, how much time are they spending on the page. Tons of little things that can totally change the way that your marketing is working. You can see, oh, do I need to change my title tag? Is it misleading to people? Do I have a high bounce rate? Little things like that. Totally worth the time it takes to set up. So content ideation. How on earth do we do that? Well, it's not as hard as you might think. So you want to take your keywords from your competitive research. It might be from KeywordTool.io, Ubersuggest, you're looking for your long tail phrases, or maybe you're trying to target those head terms. That's up to you. But you want to relate them to the following. So who is your audience? Who are you writing for? If you're not writing for technically minded people, if that's not your audience, then I wouldn't suggest writing a long form technical article. You want to be able to relate to what they do all day. Do you write for the everyman or are you writing for the executives of the world? Write in a speech that they would understand. What are some common questions uh, that your service team gets? Those are great opportunities to make articles around those. What popular questions are there in your industry? Is there one certain problem that seems to arise with the same kind of thing? Answer that question. Be the authority. Can you simplify or explain something better than someone else? This is a great opportunity to look at what your competitors have done and kind of maybe rework some of what they've got or um, better explain it. Is there a learning curve or an education aspect to your product? So is your product super complicated? Are they going to need to call up customer service and say, oh, well, how do I do that? Don't give them the opportunity. Put it online. Everyone would rather go online than speak to someone usually anyway, right? So make it easy for them. And have you done research on a related topic? Usually small business people understand their topic better than anyone else. So you've done the research, you know the stuff, why don't you just lay it all out? So right next to it you can see an example of what I consider to be good content marketing. So yes, it matters what kind of onion you use in your soup. I personally love to cook. I'm looking at recipes all the time. If you use a yellow onion versus a red onion, something most of us don't even think about, then you're just going to go to the store and grab whatever. It makes a difference actually in the flavors of what kind of onion you use. So this person actually wrote up an article about the different kinds of onions and how you can use them and why you would want to use them, etc. It's a simple and easy thing that most people don't think about, but anyone who actually takes the time to go in and research what kind of onion they should be using is going to be a great conversion on your website. So content creation, how to. What are you good at creating? Don't try to reinvent the wheel here. If you're not good at writing long articles, don't try to. Snap some photos and include your alt text, optimize your images. It's a lot easier to take a picture than it is to write a 700 word article. You can hire someone to make an infographic if you're not good at it or record a podcast. There are plenty of ways to create content that doesn't have to be just blog posts. And if you use different forms of content, it actually makes you look more authoritative. You can also connect with a wider group of people because it's better if every kind of person is available to see every kind of content. Maybe I don't like infographics. I can read the blog post. And we also suggest that you make a content calendar and stick to it. Content calendars will change the way that you publish content because you've got a great way to say, I'm going to write it on Monday, it's going to go up on Tuesday. I'm going to write it on Thursday, it's going to go up on Friday. If you're publishing regularly, it can help Google to see you as authoritative and helpful. And it also gets your context indexed more quickly if Google knows that a post is coming. Um, also, people can expect it and know when to look forward to your next post. So they know every Tuesday morning on Facebook, you're going to be publishing your next blog post. They know what to expect. They're excited to see it. The next thing you want to do is make sure that you're sharing that. You've got to push it out. You can't just expect people to come and find your blog posts or find your videos. You want to be using social media and building your audience there. YouTube is a great place to get discovered. Email blasts, newsletters, whatever it is and whatever you feel comfortable using, that's the route you want to go. So you've all now, you're all going to go install Google Analytics on your, <laughs> on your website, which is great. And that's one of the ways that we're going to get to some of the next steps of being where 
um, your competitors are not expecting you. Um, this is where David really beat Goliath, was by surprising him, um, by coming at it in a different way. And some of these ways that we're going to walk through are so easy, and they seem so easy because they really are. Um, you won't believe how much easier this can be for small businesses than it can be for big brands. And so we'll show you some examples. To start, we can look at mobile. Um, the image on the left, MGM Resorts, this is a Fortune 500 company, and this is their mobile experience on a, on a device. You can see that the, the links are tiny. You can't look for dates and rates. You can't really actually book a room um, unless you have the teeniest, tiniest fingers or you're pinching and zooming. Um, but next to it is the Royal Hotel Las Vegas, which is right down the street competing with MGM, and it has a fantastic mobile experience. There's a really clear call to action. There's easy to tap buttons to set your arrival and departure, and then find rooms and rates. So if I were a user, I would rather choose this small business mobile experience than the big brand. Second is schema, and rich snippets, um, structured data, goes by lots of different uh, terminology, they're all related, um, but this is probably one of the biggest areas for small businesses to best the brand. Um, schema is a set of HTML, um, let's say schema, I mean, that's the best way to say it. It's, structure, it's a way of structuring your data in HTML that Google, Yahoo, Bing, and Yandex, which is the Russian search engine, all got together and agreed that they would interpret this HTML the same way and display it pretty consistently. So all schema are, they're very simple, 50 character-ish uh, pieces of HTML that you place around your content. And you can use really simple tools and then copy and paste the HTML or the schema HTML into your content um, on the back end. And it doesn't require a developer. It's super, super simple. An example of what it looks like is um, the Western Las Vegas Hotel. My little box got moved. But you, we've all seen this come up in search where that result for the Western Las Vegas brings your attention because it has those rating stars. And that rating is one of the pieces of schema um, that they've put on their site. And that's giving a competitive edge to them against their competitors because it brings your attention. There's schema for all kinds of businesses and all kinds of content. So from ratings and reviews, like you see there, to locations, your product names, product descriptions, and product ratings, which is crucial for e-commerce. Um, schema about people and creative works and articles and more, so maybe the author or the producer of that content. Um, so what you can do is go to schema.org to see all the options, which there are hundreds and hundreds of options. And then use the Google Structured Data Markup tool. Or it's a helper tool to help you play with your content visually and see where you can add the schema. And then you can actually just get the code, copy, and paste it right into your content. Super simple. Shocking that more sites aren't doing it. Only about 30% of sites have schema on them. So you can see that that's a huge opportunity. Um, next part of being where they are not expecting you is local search. So 32% of us click on the map in the local search engine results pages results. When there's a map displayed, we will click on that. Um, so it's pretty important that you check your location, your physical business location. And up in Google Maps, of course, that's a given. But then think about other maps and apps, like Apple Maps. That's big. That's on every, you know, every iPhone. Um, Yelp is a huge one. Foursquare. Um, you may not be engaging in Foursquare socially, but I don't know if you know, um, but Foursquare is a big, big provider of the micro, the micro local data layer that they send up to Apple Maps. So that's the real like the actual man on the street, every, you know, foot soldiers sharing your location with big data. Small businesses can have that man on the street look that um, big brands just can't have. We, don't, we can't get those kind of eyeballs as big brands. So small businesses, you can know your local following. You can know your location and all the ins and outs of your local business um, or your small business way better than a brand ever could. So you can really engage with your local followers or your small like a, a small niche following, and you can know everything that you can about what they want um, and what they expect, and you can answer their questions. One of the ways to know um, what your audience is interested in and what they're doing is to look into your channels on Google Analytics. So yeah, another reason to look into Google Analytics. 
Um, on the left, I have an example of a client of ours. They just started doing Facebook ads at space number 10. And if you look at it, you can see that they're getting fantastic engagement. Um, they've got a really low bounce rate for Facebook ads, high pages per session, and high average session duration. So people are staying on the page a really long time when they come from Facebook ads. So if we looked at that, and then coupled with their e-commerce conversions, which I can tell you happen to be fantastic for Facebook ads as well, we would all look at that and say, oh my gosh, keep going. That's a fantastic channel for you to dive into. Um, other channels are obviously email or CPC, which is cost per click, or sometimes, you know, Google AdWords is common. Um, your referrals, your organic and your direct traffic, email newsletters, that's a huge channel that people are investing in that small businesses can get that micro-local um, and, and really engage with their audiences through email. So if you look at the content marketing eight steps on the right, obviously this is our whole business, right? We're evangelists of content marketing and this eight step um, method. We eat, sleep, and breathe here at Vertical Measures. So, but actually what we've done today is touch on all eight of these steps. We, you can see that it's an ongoing cycle and we started with strategy, strategy development. We thought about how we were gonna compete with big brands. We did ideation and content creation. We did keyword research. We thought about what we were going to write and what kind of content we were going to create. And then we created it. Um, then we optimized that with on-page SEO and looking at our mobile experience. So that's the optimization piece. And then the final four steps of content promotion and distribution, lead nurture and measurement, all kind of fit into this same slide of looking at what channels, like e email, PPC, social, and what other mediums are slicing, you know, we can slice and dice and look at that data. That's what makes up those last four steps. And then we continue the process. And I think that's the biggest takeaway is that small or large brands, a lot of them can't even manage to get this kind of eight-step content marketing um, plan and in, in start rolling it out. But you can, and you can start doing it right away um, with some of these tips and more and some of these resources. So these resources are ones that we've mentioned throughout the presentation. We just wanted to make sure that they were going to be available to you. I highly recommend checking out moz.com. Their beginner's guide to SEO is absolutely wonderful. It will tell you everything you need to know, all the way from what is a website, how does Google crawl the web, and going into advanced things like how to do a JavaScript query. It's not as hard as you think it might be. Uh, we've done some great things about meta tags and how to do keyword research. If you're interested about that uh, heat map that Christina showed earlier with the Google Maps, that's in here as well. Rich snippets and schema, definitely highly recommend that. Again, super easy to put onto your website and can change your clicks like crazy. You wouldn't believe it. And the Google Structured Data Markup Helper can make sure that you've got that all implemented correctly so you are getting the advantage of taking the time to do that. And at the bottom we included um, howtoconvinceyourboss.com is something that we think is truly important. If you do work with someone else who might not be so super ready to get into content marketing and doesn't understand the whole thing, you can send them there or take some of the materials from there and just really help them to understand what is content marketing, how does it work, you know, things like that that you just saw in this presentation. Awesome. So we're going to take some questions. So if you'd like to send any over, I'll go ahead and ask the ladies here and we'll start the discussion. Um, so our first question is from Lauren. And they ask, how do we optimize videos? Where should we produce videos and where should they be hosted? Should they be on YouTube? Yes, they should be on YouTube. And this is another great win for small brands. Big brands are really overlooking YouTube in a lot of ways. Um, YouTube is a fantastic channel for, <laughs> for building a channel. <laughs> um, but optimizing your videos on YouTube is really like the old days of the wild, wild west. You actually put keywords into the description and you add tags. And some of the tags should be categorical, like kind of SEO keywords. And then it should be a mix of those plus keywords that are more natural or more semantic or what the, the video is really about um, so that are a little bit more you know, drilled down a level. Um, so that's optimizing on YouTube. And then you would definitely should be embedding those onto your website um, with an iframe, just the, the YouTube iframe code. 
Um, but around it, because Google can't read your video, I would definitely add a transcript of the video to your website. Um, and then I would add schema, there are a schema for video um, that says when it was produced, what it was, you know, the description of the video. So I would add that around it. Um, it won't show up in the search results as a video result, um, but it will help the uh, search engines understand your content, what's on there, and it will obviously provide for a great user experience. So that's how you would optimize videos. Fantastic question. I had a similar question come up in a workshop we did the other day, and someone was saying um, that Google basically has stripped out any other video channel like Vimeo or whatever from being read within that markup or I'm not even sure what the terminology would be but is that true and can you expand on that? Well I think that what they're probably talking about is that they're not showing um, the little video snippet, the rich snippet of video in the search results anymore mm -hmm. for anybody really but YouTube which gotcha. is their product and I, they'll still show it for video so okay. it's just that they're not going to show um, vertical measures video with a snippet of the, like the little uh, thumbnail uh -huh. in the search. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so you were talking about developing content. I think, Brenna, you were talking about that. And you mentioned really talking to your subject matter experts because they're really the people that will know and be able to develop something really quickly and easily. But I know a big challenge for small businesses is time and priorities. And this is often a challenge that we find of being able to develop content with the people that actually know what they're talking about. So do you have any tips for making that more efficient? Like are, you know, maybe the subject manager is writing an outline or is there outsourcing involved? Or, you know, how do small businesses actually produce the content when they're actually trying to run the business? So that's a great question. And there are obviously 1,000 different ways you can do it. If you can't take the time to do it yourself, there are wonderful resources you can go to, vertical measures, is available to help with some of that. Um, there are also other places you can go online. You can go on Fiverr. You can go to uh, like a Xeries. They're a content writing service. They're, it's so dependent on what your budget is and how much time you have to spend. I personally would recommend if you've got to work a few more hours and get in some of the content, you really know it best. So I would love for the subject matter expert, if you are the business owner, to try and do that. Try to make time in your schedule. How much time does it take to go out and try to take a few pictures of your product and upload that and just name them correctly and add an alt tag? It's not very much time and the benefit you'll see from that is higher than you might think. So just try to get yourself on a content calendar and if you um, think that you need help, there are plenty of resources online available to help with that. Yeah, and if I can add to that, um, I think a big shift that small businesses are making is they're not spending time doing other kinds of conventional marketing. They're not spending time, you know, working with photographers for a magazine shoot anymore or, you know, magazine ads. So you're just recouping a little bit of the time, in my opinion, and pushing it toward more online marketing. Um, that's one way. And then I think the other thing to do is to crowdsource your own internal resources. Ask your customer service rep what kind of questions they're getting. You know, we talked about it in ideation, but when it comes to content creation, ask your employees. We all contribute to the blog here at Vertical Measures. We all are subject matter experts on different things, and we'll, you know, we all contribute. And so crowdsourcing within your organization, whether you have, you know, a five employee staff or a hundred employees, there are experts amongst you. You just have to find them or even experts within your own industry. If you've got industry friends and you're all willing to write a few sentences on a blog post, it can be collaborative, you can all share it, you all get the benefit of that. So just don't be afraid to reach out and actually talk to people. Great, and another question that just came in, if you are changing platforms and URLs will change, would you switch from a www.website to a non-www.website, which would mean HTTP? Um, is that something that would happen or is those that's just kind of a distinction that can be taken out with how you want your domain to show up. That's totally up to you. Um, the www is something that some people prefer, some people don't like it. It depends on if you're going to be using other subdomains as well, like if you're hosting your blog on a blog dot uh, domain, then you might not want the www for user confusion. It's totally up to you and your formatting preferences. Uh, as long as you have the proper 301 redirects in place, it shouldn't matter. 
And I would say that you want to make sure the, the more important issue is that you make that whichever one you choose, the non-dub or the dub-dub version, you make that the canonical version, meaning you only link to it that way. You only you tell Google this is the preferred version, which you would do through Google Analytics and Webmaster Tools. And uh, some of your other, like if you're on a platform like WordPress, you set the canonical version of your website, the dub dub version or the non dub dub. Don't have a trailing slash at the end, or if you do, make sure that you stick with it. Just be consistent. That's the more important issue. Great. And then one more question, just to kind of wrap this up. Um, what about what you see moving forward into 2015? I mean, since we're coming up almost on Thanksgiving next week, it's almost the new year. So what kind of trends and things you see are happening or aren't happening within kind of small business SEO, and what would you kind of recommend for people to watch out for? Um, one thing that's definitely we highly want you to take away from this is that mobile is the thing. At every single conference we've been to this year, every single blog post we've read, is about how mobile optimization is becoming more and more crucial. Like 85% of big brands don't have a great mobile experience, so this is really an opportunity for you guys, especially as Google just announced recently, they're going to be adding a mobile-friendly tag in mobile search results. So if you've got a search that is bad, um, your website's not so great, you're not going to get that tag. People probably will learn to click those kinds of sites last. And they did release a testing tool, so I would Google a mobile testing tool Google. They just released that a few days ago. You can actually test your website and see how you rank. They also give uh, great opportunities for where to improve in that. Yeah, I would say mobile, mobile, mobile. Mobile is disrupt will be disruptive because it's already disrupting everything. <laughs> And if I had to choose a second one, I think it would be structured data. It would be the rich snippets in search, adding schema to your site. It is still, there's 70% of sites that haven't done it yet. And so I just think today is the day to seize that opportunity and differentiate, differentiate yourself amongst your, low, your small business competitors and your brand competitors. Awesome. Well, thank you, guys. It's so nice to kind of pick your brains over all of this. And I know we could probably go on for another hour. Um, but we're going to go on just to tell you guys that we have a webinar coming up next month, December 18th. can't believe it's December already, but this will be with our very own CEO, Arnie Ken. He knows a ton about content marketing, and he's going to be writing on eight steps to search, social, and content marketing success. So we'll go ahead and send out an email with a recording of this webinar as well as, well as the presentation, and we'll send a link so you guys can register for that. Again, thanks to Brenna and Christina, and thanks for all of you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.